All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we waited a few more minutes because people were still coming in, so I think we can now start actually officially. So it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you all to the very first live virtual workshop today. Um, on the right, I'm Tim Lichtenberg from the University of Oxford, and on the right hand side of the screen, I think you should see my mouse. Um, you see the people who helped organize this workshop, the virtual workshop, and also the former original live Lauren Center workshop. So originally for this week, um, we had planned a physical workshop at the Lawrence Center and at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. But unfortunately, be, uh, because of the pandemic, we had to cancel that workshop, which is postponed now. Uh, but instead, this gives us the great opportunity actually to introduce the live project to many more people potentially. And so uh, it's really great, uh, the outcome of um, that so many people made it here. And uh, yeah, you see the program. Uh, we are currently at the welcome and moderator intro. Um, and we have two talks today. Um, the first from Sascha Quanz from ETH Zurich. We'll talk about uh, the science of life, current status, open questions and ways to participate. And uh, this will be followed by five to 10 minutes of Q&A. This will be moderated by Sarah Rukheimer, also here from Oxford. And immediately after that, um, Denis de Freer from the University of Liège will talk about uh, the measurement principle and the technology requirements of life. Also followed by talk related question and discuss discussion section, which will be moderated by Daniel Angerhausen from ETH Zurich. Now, um, we hope that after that, these two talk related Q&A sessions, um, that can go smoothly into a more open discussion and general uh, debate. But because of the high number of participants, we uh, introduced some rules that you can see over here and uh, some, some hints that we hope you can follow during the remainder, remainder of the workshop. So first of all, we, uh, I think we try to mute all of you. If you are ever unmuted, um, please mute yourself again. Only be unmuted if you want to say something or comment some, to something. Um, you see that in the right, on the right hand side here, the unmute button. Uh, or the mute button, so please make sure it's always on unmute if you are not about to speak. Also, if you ask a question or comment, please use your real name so that we can properly, the moderator can properly allocate the question to someone in the participant list. If you are currently not using your real name, you can find that if you click on participants, then find yourself in the participant list, click on more and click on rename so that you can give yourself your real name. Uh, in the Q&A sessions, in the talk-related Q&A, um, please use the chat window to enter your question. Um, so you can find that if you click on chat at the bottom of the screen, click on that, and type your question and send it to all the participants. And the moderator of the session will read it out loud to the presenter and they will answer the, the questions. Uh, in the more general Q&A, which, uh, which, which we hope will last eventually the whole workshop until about 6 p.m., CEST, um, that uh, you can also use the raise hand feature of Zoom. So you can also type your question, which will then be read out loud by the moderator. Um, but you can also use the raise hand feature. And you can find this if you click on the participant list. And then on the right hand side of your screen, there should be a pop up uh, with, with this raise hand feature. If you click that, it will be shown uh, as, a, as your hand that, that your hand is raised. And the moderator will then pick you, unmute you and you can ask or comment. All right, and I think that's it already. Thank you very much. Uh, very welcome. Uh, and we look forward to an exciting discussion. And with that, I give the word to Sascha Quanz. Thank you very much. All right, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, can everybody hear me? I take this as a yes because I cannot see you anymore. Um, so also from my side, a very uh, warm welcome to this to this virtual workshop. It's indeed great that so many of you took the time uh, to join us this, this afternoon or morning or, or late evening, depending on where you are. Um, before we, we jump into the science of life, um, I would first like to thank uh, the life team so far for all the work and effort that they put into, into this project so far. 
and I put here some names um, uh, really contributed to, to, the, to the stuff I'm going to show you uh, specifically. Um, I thought that before we start talking about the science, it would be useful for, um, for most of you um, to understand a little bit uh, the, uh, the general um, status of, of the project and how everything came together. And uh, so I would like to spend a few slides, actually two, two or three slides on, on how, uh, what the Life Initiative actually is and where we are uh, right now. So officially Life was sort of kicked off in 2018. Um, and the goal is really to develop the science, the technology and a roadmap for this ambitious uh, space mission uh, that has the goal of directly detecting and characterizing dozens of temperate terrestrial exoplanets. And it's really about direct detection, so it's not a transit um, mission. And so this is very important because sometimes we get this question. And it's very important to emphasize that this is a mid-infrared mission. So we are really aiming at detecting the planet's thermal emissions. So it's not, not in a reflected light. So this is the grand goal of this, this whole initiative. Why do we do this? Because we are really convinced about the great scientific potential of such a mission. And uh, I hope I can convince you um, of this uh, in the coming uh, 20 or 25 minutes or so. And actually none of the currently planned missions or concepts or projects that are on ground or in space, they will provide comparable data. So it's really something that is, that is quite unique and um, uh, quite compelling as I, as I already said. So the overall context for this initiative, I think most of you are well aware that uh, on, in the, on the US side, uh, the NASA the cattle survey is still ongoing. So they're trying to figure out what the next flagship mission could be. And exoplanets the characterization is featured prominently in this, in this decadal with Luvar and Habex and also the Origin Space Telescope uh, having a big chunk of exoplanet science in, in, in their science cases. So this is important to keep in mind on, on the one hand. In particular, because now the um, Habex and Lupo are searching for reflected light of exoplanets, and Origin is a, is a transit, uh, would, would detect the transit signals of terrestrial exoplanets, in particular around M stars. On the European side, and I'm not sure whether most of you are aware of this, we're, we're going through a, a similar process in, in, in a way. So ESA is also trying to define the scientific landscape, let's say, for the time between 2030 and, and 2050, and it's called the ESA White 2050 process. So Isa would really like to understand what will the, the science themes will be for the next L class or the, the big missions. And uh, so we, we submitted a white paper um, uh, in the middle of last, uh, last year and we were invited to present the science of life at a workshop. And we're still, uh, Isa is still thinking about this. They have several committees so looking at the different concepts. And we hope that towards uh, later this summer, there will be a recommendation what sort of science uh, should be investigated in some more detail in this uh, YH2050 process. And our hope is of course that maybe exoplanets will be featured there and then maybe a mission like life could actually play a big role. And this is sort of what we, what we, what we have in mind and what we're trying to push for. Um, we should also keep in mind, and this is a little bit a uh, heads up to, to, the, to the younger people uh, today here, that there's of course significant heritage from earlier studies. So the kind of mission concept that we have in mind that did exist already 15 to 20 years ago and it was studied on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. So on the European side, there was a concept called Darwin and on the NASA side, there was a concept called TPF or Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer, so I. So there's a lot of heritage that we can build upon. However, significant progress has been made both on the scientific side, as I will show, but also on the technology side ever since. And this is why we think it's really worth revisiting this, this idea and trying to, to, to bring it to reality eventually in the next 20 to 30 years. So the goal for today um, is really to, to get the word out that this initiative here exists and we would like to bring you up to speed where we are and what we do and why we do it. And then certainly trigger also your interest and um, show uh, the, the potential that, that this, this, this mission has. And we would like to invite you to participate uh, if you want and, and if you have time. And as we will see, I think in both talks, in the science talk from me and also in the technical talk from Denis, there's ample um, opportunity to participate. I'm not going to go through all these boxes here. Uh, it's just to show that we have a project structure that is split into three uh, main working groups on the science side. Then we have a simulator working group and a technology working group. And each working group uh, has several work packages. Uh, this can be also looked at in, uh, on our webpage in, in some more detail. And we are currently trying to, uh, to refill these different boxes with names with people who are willing to contribute here and there. We already have a significant number of people investing some time. And if you, after this, this workshop today, are interested, 
um, we, we are very happy. You, you would be very welcome to, to join uh, our efforts. And what we are going to do is we're going to reach out to all of you afterwards and ask specifically uh, your permission to be added, that you can add your name to the mailing list and also ask if you're interested in participating in, in our activities. Uh, and I will come back to the science part, at least uh, towards the end of my talk. So I hope now you see a little bit where we are and what the, what the motivation for all of this is. And let me try to add more, more meat to, to, to this by, by showing you some of the, of the signs that we have in mind and that we're convinced that, that a mission like life, like life could do. So um, the way we approach the science at this point in time is really to, to split it up in three main themes or topics. And one is very generic. It means that we'd like to understand the atmospheric diversity of in particular smaller and smallish, smallish planets and to do this in the thermal, uh, thermal light. The second question is related to, to habitability and uh, I'm well aware that this is sort of a loaded term and different people have different understandings. So we have to be careful about what we mean. The way I interpret it here and will use it throughout the talk is uh, a planet that has um, surface conditions that allow liquid water to exist on its surface. And the question related to this point is really how many, uh, what, what fraction of planets that are sort of in an interesting ma mass size and, and uh, separation regime actually provides these, these kind of conditions. And we think this is an important um, uh, middle step between the generic question of atmospheric diversity on the one hand, and then uh, number three here, the question of biosignatures and trying to identify potentially um, life-bearing bearing planets. And this is, as I said, num number three in, in investigating the, the existence of, of biosignatures in, in, some of, in some of these planets. So in order to address these questions, I think most of you are well aware that spectroscopy is, is really key and um, upcoming uh, mid-infrared characterization missions, they will focus mostly on hot and warm transiting exo exoplanets. So uh, you have, we have the, the James Webb Space Telescope hopefully flying very soon, who will do transit and secondary eclipse spectroscopy for some smallish planets. Um, we have then, uh, the Argent Space Telescope, which is currently under consideration in the decadal. So we will see whether this, this, this will happen, but we will for sure have the aerial mission on the European side, which is a dedicated uh, atmospheric characterization observatory um, launching uh, towards the end of, of this decade, hopefully. Um, and I put out here a quote from the, from the aerial uh, yellow book, uh, where it says that um, in the long run, um, the, the, the goal is certainly to characterize uh, the whole range of exoplanets, in, in, in particular also potentially habitable ones. And at the moment, Ariel is probably seen as sort of a, a pathfinder for future and even more, more ambitious campaigns. And we see life as a more ambitious campaign exactly in this context that we can learn from all of these missions already quite a lot, but there's still parameter space that none of these missions will, will, will be able to cover. So we have to do, to do something else. And in particular, we have to go away from transit missions uh, simply because uh, the sample that we can study uh, will always be too small, at least with the current concepts that are that, that are listed here, for instance, because of the uh, limited probability of transits occurring uh, around around nearby stars. So this means that the next step is probably a direct detection and a direct uh, spectroscopy mission, and you can do this now in two ways. And I already indicated this. You could do this in a reflected light. In the UV, optical, and infrared wavelength, or you could do this in the thermal emission, the mid infrared, and um, I already mentioned Lubar and Hebex. So, on the, for the reflected light, there are very um, sophisticated uh, concepts and studies uh, have been done in, on, on the American side that lead to these uh, really, uh, I, I must say, impressive uh, final reports for these two, two mission concepts. And we sort of, we, the LIFE initiative is sort of on the other side. And one question, uh, I want to mention this uh, already right now, uh, is of course, um, it would be very interesting to understand what the synergies uh, could be for, for these two kind of mission concepts. So just imagine that we would have both. You know, on the one hand, we would have a reflected light mission, something like UBAR or HABEX. And on the other hand, we would have the thermal emission um, for, for an extraterrestrial planet. What sort of additional information could we gain? Um, and I think this is something that is certainly uh, still, there is certainly more work to be done in, in this direction. And for the time being, uh, uh, we sort of assume that life is a self-standing uh, mission. So uh, the planet it's gonna characterize also need to be uh, found first. And so in this regard, we're sort of similar to, to uh, the, the concept studies for Lubar and Habex, where this was also uh, some, of, some of the assumptions. 
So let me go now through these uh, different, uh, three different themes, the, the diversity aspect, the habitability aspect, and the search for, for biosignatures. And for the, for the diversity, it's very important to understand what sort of planets, how many planets, and what kind of planets life could actually detect. And we do this uh, with the help of Monte Carlo simulations, and some of you may have followed some of the publications related to life already. They knew how we, how we do this, so we take the statistics from the, uh, from the Kepler mission, and we, uh, we simulate uh, planetary systems around nearby stars within, within 20 parsecs. And then we ask the question, giving some, um, some instrument parameters and giving some additional noise sources, how many planets would a life actually be able to detect? And what I'm showing here now is, is an update of some previous um, publications uh, or previous results that we have and still have to put here a work in progress sticker because we're really uh, literally at this very moment um, updating these, these numbers again. We have a new stellar catalog. We also included now additional targets um, and uh, we also changed the way we distribute the observing time uh, uh, around different stars. These, these are details and we don't have to worry about them uh, right now too much, but this is just to, to, to let you know that in case you see some and remember some figures right now, that they are gonna, they're gonna change again in the coming two, two or three weeks um, towards the, the publication. So I'm going to show you now a, a plot um, with planets that are detected with a signal to noise of at least 10 during a two and a half year search phase. So the assumption is that life will search planets first and then we'll pick a subset during a second characterization phase that it will investigate uh, in, in some more detail. And I do this by showing, by showing uh, on the, on the y-axis the radius of the planet going from half of, uh, Earth radius up to six Earth radii. And on the, on the um, x-axis, you, you see the, the stellar insulation in solar, in solar constants. And each box now contains the average number of planets that we obtain from our Monte Carlo simulations by redoing the survey, by recreating uh, multiple universes. And I think in this case, we did 500 runs through our, our stellar sample. So these numbers are a little bit hard to read. So let me, let me help you a little bit. Uh, so I put here the, the, the sum on the, on the right-hand side. So we expect um, roughly, uh, let's say 150-ish uh, planets between uh, half uh, Earth radius and 1.5 Earth radii, uh, 230, uh, let's say, in the mini Neptune regime, and then 60 in, in, in the Neptune regime. And we sort of limited the, the, the study to these to this radii for the time being. Um, uh, but of course, there could also be giant planets to, to be detected. And this actually was one of the reasons when we did the first kind of simulations in this direction, these numbers that did not really change, change very much. Uh, but it's very important that right now these simulations, they really uh, include all astrophysical noise sources you, you could imagine for an interferometer. And Denis in his talk will discuss a little bit more in detail how the measuring technique actually works. But for those of you who are interested in, in what goes into the simulation, so this really includes the emission from the local zodiacal dust. It includes exosody uh, dust disks that we, uh, where we took the results from the host survey of the LBTI. So we also sampled there randomly. We put exosody disks around the distance, uh, distant uh, stars. And we also take into account stellar leakage. Uh, so we really have basically all major astrophysical noise sources included in the simulations right now. And we assume in this case, our baseline is uh, four telescopes with roughly two meter uh, uh, aperture. Um, the instrument um, noise terms, they're still currently being included in the simulator. The hope is that, of course, we're limited by the astrophysical noise, not by the instrument noise. And this is why I think these numbers are, are sort of uh, representative. They will change a little bit, as I said, but hopefully not too much. Um, and if they do, they should, they should go up because we, we are increasing the, we, we're having better, a smarter way now of distributing the observing time. I want to highlight one box down here, and this is uh, the, the box uh, with uh, planets that have radii between 0.5 and 1.5 Earth radii and receiving a, a flux between 0.35 and 1.75 uh, times the solar, the solar constant. Because this is sort of the, 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 the regime where you can expect um, you know, habitable planets to, to, to lie. And uh, the numbers that we get here is uh, from this simulation that we get 26 with a signal to noise of 10 and we had 46 with a signal to noise of five. And I think these are very important numbers um, to, to keep in mind, uh, how many planets we will get even uh, during the search phase for further, for further characterization. And I will argue in a few minutes why we think uh, 30 to 50 is a good number to aim for in this uh, part of the, of the parameter space. So keep in mind, 
and uh, that between let's say 30 and 50, this seems to be really within reach during the search phase uh, for, 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 for the mission. So all of this uh, is really now done with a new simulator tool that we're, uh, we're working on right now that can create mock observations. Uh, so real mock observations where we take the geometry of the interferometer in account, where we take the different noise sources into account, as I already said, and where we uh, currently are also taking uh, work on including instrumental, instrumental noise. And here's one, one simulation uh, that, that shows you how a planet is really detected. This is a high sequence noise example. It's a planet that has 1.5 Earth radii, 10 parsec, uh, roughly 300 Kelvin temperature. And uh, the, the on-source integration time is, is relatively long. But this shows you that uh, this is how the signal that can, we can extract actually looks like. And you may wonder what is the, the, the signal uh, on the other side. This has to do with the way uh, the measurement works, and, and then he will talk about the, the, the creation of this transmission maps uh, during, during his talk. So we always have this, at least in the current way, uh, we, we think the architecture should look like. You always have this, uh, this uh, sort of pattern with a plan on the one side, and then uh, exactly on the other side, you have these, these other wings. With this, we can actually extract uh, spectral information because we assume that we will operate roughly between three and 20 microns. Uh, the exact reference range is still to be determined, but you get a spectrum and you can hear, this is, this is uh, now an example, how uh, the input spectrum, which was a black body, is retrieved uh, from, these, from these stimulations. And this helps us to understand how well we can uh, constrain uh, exoplanet uh, parameters already during the search phase. And in particular, uh, this relates to the, to the radius of the planet and to the temperature of the planet which is uh, just the, the luminosity of, of, of the object, obviously. Uh, but it helps us to understand how well we can do this in the first round of observations, because this is important to understand how we prioritize um, uh, planets for uh, a second visit or even a third visit or for some in-depth follow-up observations. And I will come back to this point uh, uh, later on. This is to demonstrate that we can also extract signals from multiple uh, planetary, uh, multiple planet systems. So you have three planets here uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, it's the brightest object with has a sequence noise in excess of, of 16. Um, then in the middle one, uh, in the middle panel, you have um, a sort of intermediate case. And on the right-hand side, you have a planet that is detectable with an SNR of five. And they were all simulated uh, with, this, with this live sim tool. And we extract one signal uh, after the other. Uh, just to learn how well we can then constrain uh, planetary properties. And this is uh, again shown here with, the, with the, what kind of plants were simulated. These are now plants with one Earth radius, 10 parsec, and a certain uh, different separations. Uh, we have exozoti disks included, and this corresponds roughly to 35 hours uh, on, on source time. And now if you ask the question, what we can learn from the direct spectra, um, we took here as an example the weakest signal uh, from, these, from these three planets. And we asked the question, how well can we constrain the radius of the planet? How well can we constrain uh, the temperature of the planet and also its position? And all three planets are plotted here. Uh, the three planets I just showed, uh, temperature on the x-axis and the radius on the, on, on the, uh, on the y-axis, with the error ellipsis, uh, the true values uh, being the, the crosses, and the derived uh, expected value is the, uh, the dots. And that does just focus on the, 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 um, the weakest signal, which is the green curve. So we get the radius uh, to plus minus 0.3 Earth radii. We get the temperature to plus minus 50 uh, Kelvin. And we get the astromatic uh, position to plus minus 0.02 AU and the, the position angle to plus minus uh, 0.3 degree. And we are now doing this for the whole survey sample to really build up statistics how well we can from a single epoch observations already determine these kind of fundamental properties. And um, I'm very optimistic that these numbers are really very promising in the sense that we can really nail down uh, radius, temperature, and also the position very well with a single visit. And this is certainly one of the big uh, advantages of looking at the thermal emission, that in particular radius and temperature are much better constrained than for instance in, in, in reflected light. So coming back now to the question of, of um, uh, habitable planets, um, I already mentioned the number of 30 to, to, to 50 planets that we would like to, to, under, to investigate in, in some more detail in the specific uh, uh, range of parameter space between 0.5 and 1.5 Earth radii and between uh, flux ranges of 0.35 to 1.75 times this, the, the solar constant. 
And um, it's whenever you find a planet and you can claim it's habitable or you find biosignatures, of course, you're golden. You can say, well, this is, this is amazing and we can do all the great studies. So we try to turn the question around and we want to make sure that in the case that we don't find anything that is super spectacular, we still want to learn something that is fundamentally important scientifically. So we basically ask the question, how many planets do we need to observe in order that the null result of finding that nothing is really interesting, quotes on quotes, is a meaningful result. So the, hypothet the hypothesis we, we put forward here is the following. We, asked, we assume that 50% of planets that are in this part of the parameter uh, range, with, this, uh, with the radius in this, in this range that I've just mentioned, and lying at a separation from the star, that, uh, so that the incoming flux is in, is in this uh, range of, of incoming uh, irradiance. So we, we assume, let's assume that 50% of the planets, they do provide uh, conditions for liquid water. And then the question is, if you now observe a number of planets, how constraining is the null result so that none of the planets we see do actually show these kind of conditions so that we can rule out this hypothesis. And below here in the plot, we show the confidence with, uh, how, with how, how well we can actually re reject this, this hypothesis as a function of the number of planets. So if you, object, if you observe two pla uh, 10 planets, I'm sorry, 10 planets in this uh, part of parameter space, and none of them is, uh, has conditions for liquid water, then it's not really constraining yet. But as you increase the number of planets you characterize, the stronger and stronger, obviously, the null result becomes. And we can now have a statistical framework here to really help us find out what is a good number of planets to aim for in order to make sure that in case no planet turns out to be, uh, turns out to have conditions for liquid water, that this is, this is scientifically important. So this is the case now for the assumption that 50% that of the planets provide liquid water on the surface. And now you can play around with this hypothesis and you can say what happens if only 20% um, provide the conditions for liquid water and so on. You can, of course, play and pick whatever number you favor. Um, so if you have 20%, of course, um, then the, the constraining power goes down. Or in other words, you need to find more planets and investigate more planets for this um, uh, non result still being constraining. And we, we, we went back and forth between the 50 and the 20% case. And then we settled that uh, here, this number, 30 to 50, this is roughly the, a good number to, to aim for. Uh, to make sure that we reach a mission concept that gives us at least these kind of, uh, this kind of number of planets, because then we have this, this constraining power, even for the case that even if only 20% of the planets um, that are in this part of parameter space provide, these, uh, provide conditions for, for, for liquid water. So this is why I emphasize this number of 30 to 50 to begin with. And this is part of an ongoing study. Is this the right number? Is this the right question? And this is certainly something that we're going to look at in the future in, in some more detail as well. Maybe there's other re good reasons to aim for this number. Maybe there's other good reasons to aim for higher or lower numbers. And this is part of the ongoing work in the, in the science team. Let me come to the, to the uh, final part uh, related to, uh, to biosignatures and to atmospheric characterization in some, more, in some more detail. So what we are currently working on is we would really like to understand uh, what is the spectral resolution, the wavelength range, and also the S and R that is required in order to really get a, a good handle on uh, biosignature gases, not only detecting them, but only having a good handle on the, on the quantitative abundances. And uh, there have been uh, a number of studies in the past that, this, that did this um, with examples where a planet was picked and then it was a, a certain a signal to noise and a certain spectral resolution and wavelength range was assumed. And then you got an answer how well you can constrain um, the, the, the abundances of the different molecules in the atmosphere. We would like to turn this a little bit around and would really like to derive um, scientific requirements for the, for, for, the, for the mission by doing a grid of uh, different spectral resolutions, wavelength ranges, and SNRs to really uh, inform the, the technical team that we need an SNR of, let's say, 55 at least, because then we can detect certain features with a certain confidence. And we need to have a spectral range uh, from tw uh, 3 to 20 microns, or maybe 6 to 20 microns is good enough, or maybe 17 is good enough for the long wavelength cutoff. These are the questions that we're trying, uh, currently trying to, to, uh, to work on using um, an atmospheric retrieval study. And here are some examples for, for, for spectra that we just started creating. The focus will be an Earth twin. And uh, of course, we can argue whether this is a good starting point. Uh, of course, we will not expect an Earth twin to really exist. But the argument that we would bring forward is 
if you're not able to characterize an Earth twin well, then probably we have a problem with the mission to, to begin with. So using that as a starting point is good. And then we will make cross checks using other planetary atmospheres to, to be sure that we're not missing uh, out on anything important. The spectra here, just for, for uh, just some examples that, uh, to test our, our current code, uh, we reproduce the Earth atmosphere with different um, levels of, of water. We reproduce the Mars atmosphere, and we're trying to put all this together now in a, in a Bayesian framework to do, to do the retrieval uh, analysis. The first kind of this analysis we did already last, last year, and it was part of the white paper we submitted to, to ESA. And this was like one, one, uh, one part of this, this grid, or one, one portion of the grid I was just, just describing. And uh, this showed us that this is really an important um, analysis to really, to really complete. Um, and what, what we did here is we, we compared the, the information content of um, the emission spectrum of an Earth twin to, uh, to that of the reflected, reflected light spectrum. So this is a little bit of a complicated plot, so let me walk you through this. You see um, uh, down at the bottom of the plot the different, different molecules that we, that we included in the, in the atmosphere of, of the Earth twin. And the black lines, they indicate the true value of the abundance that we put in, in, in the model. Um, and then the, the retrieved uh, red points, or the red points, sorry, they are the retrieved values from our, from our uh, retrieval uh, analysis. So in this case, we simulated the Earth spectrum between 3 and 20 micron. Uh, we assumed a signal to noise of, of 20 um, in, in, all the, in all the channels, and a spectral resolution of 100, which is probably a little bit on the, on the um, on the optimistic or on the, on the high side um, uh, compared to, to previous studies. However, you can see that in, this, in such a case, uh, we can really accurately uh, retrieve the true value that, we're, that we put in for a number of very important molecules. And on the, on, the, on, the right, on the right side of the plot, you can even also see how well we can retrieve the radius and the pressure on the ground, uh, uh, on the ground layer of the atmosphere, so at the surface of the planet in this case, and also the ground, the ground temperature. The yellow areas uh, for the molecules, the yellow areas indicate plus minus, uh, plus minus half a dec, so plus minus a factor of three. And the arrow bars on the red points, they are the one sigma arrow bars. So you can see how well we can really constrain the abundances. And for the radius, the, the, the yellow area is plus minus 0.3 um, Earth radii. Uh, for the pressure, it's really, again, half, it's, it's again half a dec, plus minus. And for the temperature, it's plus minus 10 Kelvin. And you can see how well, in this case, we can retrieve uh, all these, these, these properties. And as I said, we, we used that analysis to compare it to the reflected light spectrum. And there was a great paper published by, by Feng et al. in 2018, where they investigated uh, basically a reflected light mission similar to, to the LUVAR, where they had a, a, an Earth spectrum between 0.4 and 1, uh, 1 micron, an SNR of 20 and also a relatively high spectral resolution. And they investigated the, the reflected light and did the similar analysis as we did for the thermal emission. And you can see here the results overplotted. So the, the blue points now indicate um, how well the different abundances for the molecules that were accessible in their spectra were retrieved, also the error bars. And you can also see uh, the, the radius and the, and the, and the pressure. So I would like to highlight a few things here, that there's information that is contained in the thermal emission spectrum that you cannot get access to easily uh, in, in, in reflected light, even with, a, with this, uh, this uh, mission concept that Feng et al. Were, were studying. So this relates to, to bias signatures. For instance, methane is really, really hard to get in reflected light. It seems to be easier to be detected uh, at, at the thermal emission. Um, we also have access to, to N2O, uh, which is really not present in, in the optical or the, in the infrared um, and cannot be digged out. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see again those indicators for habitability. What's the radius? What's the ground pressure and the, and the temperature? And also there, as we already, as already indicated, the information you get from thermal emission is, is much more telling than, than for, the, for the reflected light. So this is one of the reasons why we think that uh, a thermal emission, uh, thermal emission mission is at least complementary uh, to a reflected light mission. And uh, it's now uh, one of the things we, we're gonna hopefully work on in the future is to combine the, these two things. So what would, could we actually learn if we were to even combine the, the information from the two? So once we now understand better what, what sort of requirements we have for spectral resolution, sensitivity, and, and, and wavelength range, as I said, we're gonna 
apply this also to other to other questions. And one of the grids we're going to look at is Earth through time. We would like to understand how well uh, a certain mission concept can also then constrain different atmospheres. Um, and we're going to take uh, Earth through time as, as one of these, these these examples where we're going to apply the the mission that we uh, the mission requirements that we have to these kind of uh, of planets. We're going to use the instrument simulator that we have to create mock observations and use the retrieval framework to understand how well there uh, the atmospheric abundances and properties can be derived. This was the key parts for the exoplanet part of, of, of life, but there's also other, um, other uh, communities and other science questions you can address with such a mission. And I think this is important to, to keep in mind. I would imagine that most of you are really interested in exoplanet science, but let's keep in mind that other communities studying circumstellatists or AGNs or, or star clusters, star formation and evolved stars. So everything that is basically dusty, where mid-infrared is really key and where spatial resolution is really key, they will certainly be interested in such a mission. However, until now, the, our activities was really focused on, on, um, on the exoplanets, not so much yet on these other, on these other um, science topics. So I hope I could convince you now that we're really, this is really great and you can do a lot of fantastic things with, which, uh, with such a mission. And there's lots of opportunities to contribute. And I show here again now part of this, this diagram I showed at the very beginning, now focusing on the, on the exoplanet work, working group. Um, in addition to the three different themes, um, planetary diversity, I was already mentioning, for instance, what are other questions that we should address? What are other parts of parameter space that we should investigate and why? In addition to habitable planets, uh, is 30, 50 the right number? Are there other, qu other questions that we're missing? And in addition to biosignatures, are we missing biosignatures? What about false positives and, and so on? Um, other things that we have to, to worry about. In addition to these, to these three themes where support and, and, and additional uh, manpower, uh, woman power is certainly welcome. Um, there's also uh, the question about, for instance, the target database. So we have uh, people working actively on compiling a very comprehensive database for the stellar targets. We need to get all the stellar properties in there. We need to understand what constraints on planetary systems are already existing. We need to include uh, the information about uh, debris disks and exosody disks. Uh, to have really a comprehensive database that helps us later to understand which uh, targets to prioritize and which to put on the on the primary mission, for instance. Work on other science, I already mentioned, it's not uh, has not uh, been looked at in, in great depth so far, and there's uh, certainly also uh, ways to, to contribute, as is also on the simulator side, uh, if some of you are really interested in, uh, in, in uh, building uh, sophisticated data simulators, there's uh, more, more work to be done. And Denis will talk more about the technology part in, in, in his talk. And with this, I would like to, to end and just to quickly summar, uh, summarize uh, what, what I've been saying in the last uh, 25 minutes. So life is really about a, a mid-infrared nulling interferometer. Um, and why we need an interferometer, Denis will, will justify in a few minutes. And we want to detect the thermal emission of terrestrial exoplanets primarily. The wavefunks range would probably, probably be something between 3 and 20 microns. The spectral resolution, probably between 20 and, and 100 microns. And uh, 100, uh, we will have to, have to see. And this will come up on this retrieval I was mentioning. We would imagine a total mission lifetime of five to six years. Um, the search phase first, and then the characterization phase, and also some time for the, for the other signs. This, of course, depends on how many plants we have to find first. If other missions or other projects, maybe ground-based radio velocity projects, will give us a great uh, list of targets already, then the search phase could, of course, be adapted, and we have more time on the characterization. The expected yields, at least with these typical numbers for number of telescopes, uh, size of the primary mirrors, um, and so on, uh, we really can expect hundreds of exoplanets to be detected. And this is one of the things that, were, that was not clear 15 years ago when ESA and NASA was looking into these concepts uh, for the first time. Back then we had no idea about the exoplanet population out there, so it was really hard to justify or to guess how many planets to, to, to expect. And this is one of the things that now fundamentally changed, uh, I think, the arguments in favor of, of such a mission, because now we can really quantify what we can expect depending on uh, the architecture that, that we're gonna, we're, gonna pick, we're gonna pick in the end. And I believe that um, um, there's really unique scientific potential for the atmospheric characterization because there's so much more information in the thermal emission spectrum than there is in the reflected light or in the transit spectrum. And this we should really leverage and, and use as a, as a main argument for, 
for, uh, for this mission going forward. And with this, I would like to thank for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for that talk, Sasha. Um, I'm Sarah Buchheimer. I will be moderating the brief Q&A after uh, this talk. You're getting some claps in the comments. Uh, so the first question uh, is from Harold Michaelis about what is the integration time needed to get a signal to noise of 10 or if you want to comment on the integration time and how that relates to the SNR, that'd be uh, excellent. Yeah, the, the, the SNR, of course, depends on what kind of planets you have and where, how distant the, the, the planet is. Uh, the distance from us to, to the stellar system, this is really the, the key parameter uh, here. And we see that anything, let's say, beyond 15 parsecs is really going to be challenging. It's not impossible, but within reasonable numbers for uh, mirror sizes and integration times, this, this is, um, is going to be challenging. So I cannot give you a precise number, but let, let me... Uh, right now, uh, but I may, let, me, let me give you an example. So for the, the survey, we have roughly 330 stars in there, and we assume uh, an, a search phase of, of two years. Uh, so now you can divide this, uh, these numbers and you get an idea how much time you spend on average on, 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 on a star. And this is now currently being uh, investigated in, in one, of the, on one of the analysis that we're currently doing. We want to understand how this depends on different architectures and the different mirror sizes and the papers in preparation where all these numbers will be, will be published. Great, thank you. Um, from Ishran Mishra, there's a question, has the retrieval study of an Earth twin been published? No, it's work in progress. <laughs> We are working on this. Um, we have uh, we have um, a postdoc here in Zurich working on this together with an undergraduate student. Um, everything is being currently being tested and validated, and we helped around the the grids in, in the let's say starting in four to five weeks. So over the summer we hope to write everything up. Um, and then we have a question from uh, Steve Ertel. Is there a plan to solicit white papers or so for other science? And before you uh, address that, I just wanted to note, I saw a raised hand come up, but please for the questions, type them in to the box the, for the raised hand feature we'll be using in the discussion. So any questions for, the, for this talk specifically, please uh, type them into the chat box. So for, for, the, um, for, for the white papers, um, I know there's, there's, I know some colleagues who are particularly interested in AGN studies. Um, they didn't really have time to look into this in some detail. We would hope that with this workshop and going forward, we would really try and assemble um, smaller teams to work on specific, specific questions related to, to the other science. So the answer is, it is in the planning, uh, but no one is uh, right now actively working on writing, writing a white paper. So we are certainly looking for, for, uh, for support there. All right, it looks like we have another three questions and then we'll move on probably to the next talk. Uh, so Lee Grenfell asks, uh, could you maybe say a few words on how well we know Eta Earth for 0.5 to 1.5 Earth radii? Yeah, so we, what we use is we use the, the underlying statistics from the NASA SAG-13 group. And for this, for this part, uh, if, you use this, if you use these statistics and when you look at this uh, range of parameter space, uh, Eta Earth is roughly, if I'm not mistaken, 0.3 to 0.35 for solar type stars and 0.5 for M type stars. So this seems to be on the high side um, compared to some of the most recent uh, Kepler analysis. So part of our exercise in quantifying uh, the, the yield is that we're going to artificially also um, create a population that is a factor of two lower, and then going to see how how this impacts the overall number of of potentially habitable planets. Uh, we have a question from Bertrand Menison on does the simulator uh, do the detection numbers and the detection numbers include full search completeness calculations, randomizing orbital parameters, and apparent planet separation over their orbit? So everything is randomized uh, and for the, for the planetary systems. We do not have any, we did, we did not tackle the question of completeness yet. It's one of the things on our, on our to-do list. At the moment, it's sort of a stupid survey. Uh, we're gonna point the telescope to each star, one after the other, and we just count what is detected. There's no revisit, there's no optimizing in terms of where's the stuff on the planet of the sky. This is part of future work. 
So there's certainly room for, room for improvement. And the question of completeness, this was, we just started recently discussing this uh, very actively because uh, if for some reason um, the Kepler statistics do not apply to the nearby stars, we want to understand how well we can then constrain the, the, uh, the existence of plants in the solar neighborhood. And there the completeness parameter is very, very important. But this requires a sort of a different simulation approach that we did not yet have time to implement. Uh, from Gerard Van Bell, there's a question of why have the mission take care of its own search phase rather than have a separate near-term mission for the target search? Um, <laughs> it would be great if we don't have to search. Uh, I think I think we we have to for this at the time being. It's not clear where the plans would come from, honestly. In particular, for solar type stars, uh, I think there's a big question mark. Well, fingers crossed that we reach really the noise floor that we can detect uh, Earth twins from radio velocity from the ground. But but it's, at the moment, we're not there yet. That, that's my, my impression. So if there is a way to get our targets, that, of course, would bring a lot of extra time for the characterization. We think it's better to, to make sure that we split the, the mission at this point in time in these two phases that life would be self-standing, that we can demonstrate we will find sufficient targets and we have sufficient time to characterize them. And if for some reason this is not necessary, we have more time for characterization, that's even much better. All right, and we have a question from Ryan McDonald on concerning the retrievals have predicted, uh, have predicted detection significances for individual molecules when computed by a Bayesian model for comparisons. We will, we will do this. Um, I would have to go back to, to Mike, to Mike Lyon, how he did this, this, this first go around last summer. I don't recall the details there, but this is really part of, this will be part of the, the work we're going to do in the coming months here. I think we're going to have to move on to uh, the next talk for now. We do have a few more questions coming in, which we can address in the discussion session after the second talk. We'll keep those available, as well as we should note that if there are questions that we don't get to today within our meeting time, we plan to post uh, the Q&A on the Life Mission website. So if, uh, if people have questions that we're not able to get to, don't worry, we'll try to address those at some point. But for now, let's move to the next talk and uh, give a virtual clap to Sasha again. Thanks very much, everybody. Can you hear me, everyone? Hi. Yes. I think that is yes. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, virtual workshop. It's my pleasure to uh, talk about the measurement principle of life and the technology requirement. Um, over the next uh, 20 minutes, I will um, give a brief status about um, the huge progress that have been made in interferometry over the past uh, decades. Um, and I will explain where we stand uh, and what we need to do in order to make life uh, happen in the following decades. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, listed here on this slide for helping me and, and sending me uh, slides uh, for, this, for this presentation. Um, so where do we stand today in, in, in exoplanet imaging? So this is a, a typical picture that we can take uh, with a state-of-the-art eight-meter class telescope. Uh, you can see four giant exoplanets uh, on, on this picture. The star is masked at the center by a coronagraph. And so typically we are sensitive to planets which are 5 to 10 AU from uh, uh, the central star. We can, take, uh, we can characterize these exoplanets uh, by taking spectra. Um, so this is an example here. You can see a K-band spectra of HI799 e, that's the inner planet around, around that star. And uh, actually last year, we obtained the first, uh, uh, the gravity collaboration, uh, obtained the first uh, interferometric measurement of an exoplanet. And that's a remarkable result uh, that you can see by the, the gray point on, on this uh, spectrum, uh, that's, that's the gray point. That's a remarkable result because the, the precision on this spectrum is really, really good. It's five to 10 times better than what we can get with, with single ditch uh, eight meter class telescope. The precision also on, on the astrometry on this kind of measurement is, is, is really good. 
And so the challenge right now in, in exoplanet imaging is to go closer to the star. Um, so we want to go in the habitable zone. So this is the red circle that you see um, on, on, the, on, on the background plot here. Uh, and we, we, we want to design an instrument that can go inside this habitable zone and make the same kind of measurement. And we know now from Kepler that there are a lot of these uh, rocky exoplanets in this zone. We just don't know how to directly image them. Uh, we, we cannot do that right now. So what are the, the technical uh, requirements uh, to achieve this, uh, the detection of these exoplanets in the habitable zone at 10 micron? Um, there are basically three main requirements. That's angular resolution. We need high angular resolution, uh, contrast, and sensitivity. And on this plot, uh, you can see the contrast at 10 micron as a function of angular separation for a, a, a random but realistic uh, exoplanet population. So this is an exoplanet population that was generated based on the Kepler statistic um, by the, the, the software that Sasha mentioned just before. Um, the color of the, of the points uh, depends on the, the spectral type of the star. Uh, you can see the purple vertical line that's the inner working angle of current uh, eight meter class telescope. So basically at, at 10 micron right now, we can resolve the habitable zone around uh, the closest star to us, which is Alpha Centauri, uh, A and B. Uh, with the next generation extra large telescope, uh, like the ELT and the MECHES instrument uh, at 10 micron, uh, the inner working angle would be the, this vertical blue line. So it would be possible to uh, image a few more um, habitable zones around us. Um, but in order to really characterize a significant number of uh, rocky exoplanets, we need a much better angular resolution, a larger telescope. And so if you take a nulling instrument, an interferometric instrument uh, with a 500 meter baseline uh, at 10 micron, the, this, this green line shows you what kind of angular resolution we can get. And this is sufficient to characterize most habitable zones around nearby stars. The second constraint is to uh, achieve a really huge contrast, a good contrast between the star and the planet. Um, so this is the horizontal uh, blue, green box here. Um, and the position of this horizontal line depends on the instrument stability. The, the, the more stable your instrument, the lower can be this line. And uh, this will be driven by the science requirement that we are currently uh, working on with the live science team. Uh, but to give you an idea, uh, we need to achieve contrasts which are typically 10 to the minus six. So we, we need to suppress the starlight uh, by a factor of, of 1 million more or less in order to characterize all these uh, exoplanets. So what, what is a good solution to do that? There, there is a solution which is called nulling interferometry which combine actually uh, starlight rejection and angular resolution. Uh, it was proposed the first time in 1978 uh, in the Nature paper uh, by Bracewell. And the idea is shown by this graph on the, right, on the right. And the idea is to combine the light from two different telescopes in phase opposition. So you introduce a pi phase shift in one of the arms. And when you do that, you produce a destructive interference on the line of sight. So that's the bottom right plot. Um, you can see that the star, which is on the line of sight, um, will be uh, uh, canceled by the destructive interference. And a planet, which is off axis, can be transmitted. Um, and so the position of the maximum of transmission depends on the, the baseline and the wavelengths at which you, you observe. There is a good way to, to see this. Uh, that's the middle um, map here. This is a transmission map of a 2, 2D, uh, a two element uh, Muller. So you can see white uh, fringes and, and dark fringes. And the transmission map of a Muller is some kind of photon sieve that you put on the sky. Everything that falls on the dark stripe, a dark fringe, will not be transmitted. And everything that falls on a, on a white fringe will be transmitted. On top of that, you can, uh, this is what, what was proposed by Bracewell in the first paper, is to rotate the instrument. And when you do that, you can see that the planet, which is this little uh, blue uh, dot, will uh, be modulated with the rotation angle. So you will go, uh, you, you can see the transmission uh, as a function of rotation angle at, in the bottom middle plot. So it will go between one and, and zero. 
And it's important to modulate the planet signal in order to retrieve it uh, against uh, noises. This is really the key. If you observe the same system, uh, so it's in this case, that's a um, nurse sun system at 10 parsecs with a 10 meter class telescope. This is what you would get on the left plot. So you can see the PSF of the central star and the position of the planet. And so the planet will be hidden by the, the, the PSF of the central star. So it will be within the diffraction limit of this 10, 10 meter class telescope. For life, we are considering uh, more than two telescopes. So this is what you can see on the right plot. You can see uh, the transmission map of a, of a four element uh, instrument. And so you can see now that this uh, transmission map is, is going in 2D. Um, and the idea to do that is to increase the modulation efficiency, the modulation speed of the planet, because the highest the modulation frequency, the better you can uh, subtract uh, noises. Um, and so you can see the, the, the transmission as a function of rotation angle at, in the balloon plot, and you can see that the frequency is, is higher in this case. Um, so the, the, the technique which is used uh, for a four element nulling instrument is, co is called phase shopping. And the way it works is summarized on this, on this uh, scheme here. So on the left, you see uh, the four elements of, of the, the array, uh, two at the top and two at the bottom. And so the, each pair is a nulling instrument. And the destructive output of each of these nulling instruments is combined together um, on, uh, on a plate and produce these two uh, chop states, that's the, the, the two middle uh, plots, which are anti-symmetric. And then when you do the difference between the two chop states here, you produce the modulation map, which is the top right plot here, which is the response of the instrument uh, to the sky. If you add the rotation to this, uh, you can modulate your planet signal really quickly. And then you can produce the point, point, spread, point spread function that you see at the bottom right plot, which is similar to what uh, Sasha was showing before where you can see the, the planet on the left part of this plot and then an anti-symmetric response on the right part. Um, and so the idea is to use templates uh, to uh, demodulate the planet signal in order to find uh, where is your planet in the field and, and to retrieve multiple planets as, as shown by, by Sasha. So why do we need to go to space? Uh, the main reason is, is obviously the sensitivity. So if you, if you look at, uh, at stars from the ground um, at 10 micron, uh, it's really difficult. So the, the, the atmosphere is as bright as the brightest star in the sky. And so it's something like 100, times, 100 million times brighter than exoplanets, than a, a rocky exoplanet. So it's not possible to observe a large number of, of, of planets from the ground. We need to go to space to, to achieve the right sensitivity um, and a formation flying space interferometric instrument will combine uh, all, all the elements that we need for this kind of science. So the sensitivity from uh, the space environment, the stability and precision also, uh, and the angular resolution provided by the interferometric baseline. So it really combines all the three uh, requirements uh, for these uh, challenging uh, tasks. Now I will jump into the uh, technological requirements um, for this kind of mission. Um, the first one is uh, formation flying. So this is to achieve the angular resolution. If we need a baseline of 500 meters, uh, currently there is no way to launch a, a telescope which is that big, a monolithic telescope which is that big in space. Uh, we need formation flying technologies. Um, starlight suppression, so that's nulling interferometry, but there are technologies involved behind this to uh, achieve a really stable uh, starlight suppression. And then a really good sensitivity uh, that can be provided by uh, passive cooling or, or low thermal noise and really good, excellent uh, mid IR uh, detectors. So now I, I will revise um, quickly each of these three points uh, and uh, give a few, and, and say a few words about ongoing activities uh, on these three topics. So formation flying, uh, the requirements it's, are not that stringent, come, unlike what uh, most people believe. Uh, so we only need a, a positioning accuracy of a few centimeters 
uh, between the telescope. Um, the rest of the correction will be taken care of by uh, internal loops and, 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 and piezo mirrors uh, inside the, the beam combiner spacecraft. Uh, we need at least four spacecraft in order to do phase chopping, uh, and the array has to rotate uh, to, to have this modulation of the planet signal and, and, and being able to, to, to recover the position of the planet. So where do we stand in, in information flying today? So there was a mission called uh, PRISMA, it's a Swedish mission that was launched in uh, 2010, um, which demonstrated formation flying with two, uh, two small spacecraft uh, called Mango and Tango that you can see on the bottom uh, plot. And they demonstrated the formation flying with a precision of a few centimeter RMS over four hours. Uh, in 2022, there will be an ESA mission called, called Proba 3 uh, to demonstrate uh, an even better precision uh, of a 100 micron RMS, uh, positioning accuracy between the two uh, spacecraft. Uh, and this will exceed the, the control requirement on, on life. Uh, past decades, there have also been some work in the lab at JPL, a lot of work actually about formation control test beds. Uh, they, they use three spacecraft in 2D on, on air cushions to demonstrate the rotation and the positioning uh, algorithm of uh, a lifelike uh, array. Um, and they demonstrated the precision of five centimeter RMS in, in, in this case. Ongoing activities on formation flying. So there was a news last week that NASA selected a, a mission called Sunrise uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, and it's a six unit CubeSat flying at 10 kilometers from each other and to study the sun. Uh, sun we have to keep an eye on, on, on this mission. It will be important because it will involve more than two, uh, two, two elements. There is also activities in the group of Mike Ireland in, 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 at ANU uh, about developing a formation flying ground and, and CubeSat demonstrator. Uh, the idea is to have a uh, full six axis movable telescope, uh, which can be used to demonstrate uh, CubeSat compatible uh, metrology system for formation flying and interferometry uh, in space. Uh, the next, uh, now I'm, I'm going into the next. Um, requirement, technology requirement, uh, which is starlight suppression. Um, so roughly the high level requirements on the instrument, on the instability of the instrument will be to reach a null depth, so a contrast of 10 to the minus five uh, with a stability of 10 to the minus six over 50,000 seconds, which is um, more or less 15 hours uh, over the whole band bandwidth. So something like five to 20 micron. Uh, and this puts huge uh, constraint on the uh, control of the, of the array. So the, the amplitude has to be controlled with a precision of 0.05% RMS. And the phase, so the different uh, phase between the, the arms of the instrument uh, has to be controlled with a precision of one nanometer RMS. Um, so this is something that is uh, a challenging control problem, uh, but we can probably relax this, this constraint using post-processing technique. It's something we need to, to work on uh, in, in, in the live project. State of the art at 10 micron, I will, I will focus on, at, on, on 10 micron milling interferometry. So there has been a different uh, test bench at JPL, uh, NASA JPL, uh, and mostly the, the planet detection test bed, which has demonstrated uh, null depths of uh, eight times 10 to the minus six. Uh, with a precision stability of 10 to the minus eight. So this is good enough uh, for life. This is the requirements. Uh, this was done at room temperature and over 10% bandwidth. And so one, one of the goal, I will come back to that, of, of, of the workshop of, the, um, of one of the test bench that ETH is working on, which is called NICE, I will come back to that, is to reproduce this kind of experiment at cryo temperature. And you can see actually the, at the, the bottom plot here shows the results from this, uh, this test bench, from the JPL test bench. So you can see uh, the modulation map uh, of, of the, the, the bench and you, the blue point are the measurements. That's the planet measurement, uh, the simulated planet measurement. And that's the, the measurement that were used to uh, produce the result of uh, stability of 10 to the minus eight after post-processing, which, uh, which is amazing. Um, 
with the right uh, modulation uh, template, as you can see by the red, uh, the red line. Uh, there also, we have been working on, 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 on milling interferometry at 10 micron in, on the ground with ground-based telescope. Um, and so on the LBTI and interferometric nuller in Arizona, we have been achieving null depths of 10 to the minus two and a stability of 10 to the minus four um, after post-processing. This was limited mostly by the thermal background, this, uh, this uh, classical problem for 10 micron ground-based astronomy. This is a problem that we won't have uh, in space. Uh, now I'm going into the third um, requirement about sensitivity. Uh, we'll just say a few words about what is needed. Uh, and uh, one of the main key technology of, of life is the detector, an infrared detector working at from five to 20 micron. And actually the, the quality of the detector will have a direct impact on the spectral resolution that we can use to characterize the exoplanet. So this detector has to have a really low read noise and a high QE um, to maximize the number of planets that we can characterize and, the, num and the, the spectral resolution that we can achieve. So the requirements are under study, but likely will have to be five times better than the James Webb MIRI uh, detector um, in terms of read noise. So right now the, the James Webb detector is something like 14 electron RMS, and we would aim for something which is uh, a few electron RMS uh, if we really want to um, achieve the 100 uh, spectral resolution that we need. Um, thermal noise and detector cooling. So the key uh, aspect here is to achieve uh, optics uh, have to be cooled down to 40K. Uh, in order to keep the, the good uh, performance at 20 micron. Um, we have also to have uh, to design the baffle and the surface has to have to be really clean uh, in order to mitigate scattered light. So this is a, a huge uh, designing problem for the, for the telescopes. Uh, it also has to be uh, really thermally stable uh, in order to have stable null measurement. And uh, we know that's possible to achieve this kind of uh, cooling uh, passively, uh, so to reach optics to down to 40K. This has been done by, uh, on the Herschel and Planck satellite, for instance. Um, so the knowledge on, on, on how to do that is, is, is there, uh, especially on the ESA side. Um, next, I will jump into the current activities. Um, that we are planning to do over the next few years uh, regarding life. So ETH is working on, the, on NICE, which is the ETH cryogenic test bench. NICE is for Nulling Interferometric Cryogenic Experiment for Life. And the goal of, of NICE is to enhance the technology readiness uh, of broadband nulling um, and to uh, demonstrate the nulling combination scheme at cryo temperature and beyond the 10% bandwidth. So the, one of the goal would be to, to reproduce this experiment that, uh, that was done at JPL at, uh, at room temperature. You can see again that the plot at the, at the bottom would be to reproduce this measurement uh, with the same precision, uh, but at cryo temperature uh, in order to increase the TRL level of, um, of life. Another new activity uh, that we are starting in, in a few months, uh, it's, we, want, we will develop the first nulling instrument for the VLTI. So the VLTI is the interferometric uh, facility in, uh, uh, in Chile. Um, and so we have two concepts. One is called I-5 and one is called Viking. And so the goal is to build the first nulling instrument for the VLTI and to, in order to do precision spectroscopy and astrometry at L-band, so 3.8 micron. Scientific goal would be to constrain planet formation and access to the snow line. So the, the baseline of the VLTI can go up to 200 meters, which, which can provide really high angular resolution in order to go um, within the snow line and within the habitable zone of nearby stars. So we got, uh, we received in, at the University of Liège an ERC grant to build such an instrument uh, over the next five years. And also one of the goal of these uh, new uh, ideas and concepts would be to demonstrate the live beam combination scheme, data acquisition and reduction techniques uh, on sky. 
Uh, also this year, uh, the LBTI team in Arizona published the result from the host survey, uh, which was dedicated to looking at the dust level in the habitable zone of nearby stars. So as you may know, this, this dust in the habitable zone is a noise for life. We don't want the, the star that we observe to have too much of this dust because it will mask uh, planets uh, in the habitable zone. So the LBTI was designed to look at this dust using nulling interferometry at 10 micron uh, using two telescopes. So the, the results were published this year. And uh, the good news is that the, the results are that the, the median dust density around nearby stars is 3 zodi. And we have good confidence that it's uh, below 27 zodi, so 95% confidence. So that's a really good news for life. But I also showed this plot to show you what kind of precision that we can achieve with nulling and interferometry. So the bottom plot show the sensitivity of different instruments um, in terms of zodi. So one zodi is one time the density of the dust in the solar system. And you can see in yellow WISE. WISE, this is this, this single dish photometric space instrument. The sensitivity is uh, around 1000 zodi. Um, and it's mostly limited by the calibration of the stellar flux. So if WISE cannot subtract the the stellar flux um, besides by calibrating it uh, in post-processing. And this is what's limiting the, the precision. From the ground first with the first generation milling instrument, so the Keck Nuller in blue, uh, so milling instrument, so removing the starlight from the, from the data, uh, you can gain one order of magnitude in, on, on, on the measurement, so more or less 100 zodi uh, sensitivity. And then the new generation milling instrument, the LBTI, uh, go even further with another order of magnitude uh, in the detection. Um, so by, by removing really the, the starlight, we can uh, uh, improve uh, the, the quality and the, and, and, and the contrast that we can achieve in the habitable zone, even being on the ground compared to space um, in this case. There are other activities uh, on nulling, actually a lot of activities. So Caltech and, and, and JPL are working on the Vortex Fiber Nuller for the Keck. And the idea is to combine nulling with uh, uh, high resolution spectroscopy. This is a really promising, promising idea. There is also the GLIT instrument on Subaru doing nulling on a single um, a mirror uh, with, with sub uh, aperture and to demonstrate uh, integrated optics nulling um, at, at, at three micron. Uh, the University of Paris, uh, the team of Sylvester Lacour is also working on the PIXAP project, which is a 3U CubeSat in order to demonstrate uh, light injection into single, single mold fibers in space uh, and to achieve really precise uh, photometry uh, in space. Um, this is my summary slide. So this is the key points of my talk. Um, I, will, I will go over them. So, we are now in the new era of exoplanet characterization with long baseline interferometry. We have seen the new result from the gravity team uh, with the first characterization of an exoplanet using uh, interferometry. We have been doing a lot of progress in key technologies over the past few uh, years and decades uh, in, in key technologies like, like formation flying, so starlight suppression, ground-based nulling uh, in the US um, with the Keck Nuller and the LBTI. We are starting new projects in Europe uh, to, uh, to, to push the technology of nulling interferometry. So there is the, the nice test bench to demonstrate cryogenic nulling, uh, enable the live uh, technology. There is this, the, the ERC nulling instrument for the VLTI, which is starting over the next five years. Also working on formation, formation flying using CubeSat uh, in, in, in Australia. Uh, but we need more technology support program, uh, especially to, co to improve the broadband coverage of such an instrument uh, to, to increase the 10% the bandwidth uh, and nulling over the whole live uh, bandwidth. And for that, we need to work on spatial and modal filters, the beam, technology, the beam combination technologies, and to get better uh, detectors. So if you are interested in, in, in contributing to uh, one of these uh, uh, topics, please uh, contact us. Uh, I, I put the email of Sasha for the, for the science, Adrian Glauser for the nice uh, ETH test bench, and myself for the technology or the nulling uh, VLTI instrument. 
And I will end this talk by uh, two announcements. So we have in December uh, this year, we have two uh, workshops. We have first uh, the two days live workshop, will be the third uh, workshop after the one in, in Berlin and the one in Zurich. Um, and so you can find the, the information about the workshop on, on this page. And it will happen the same week. So the, the next two days, we will have the sci-fi workshop one, which will kick off this ERC project to build um, a knowledge instrument uh, on the VLTI. And so if you're interested, please, please contact me. Uh, and I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denis, for this uh, great talk. So also from my side, briefly, uh, yeah, there's a big wave of virtual applause for you, Denis. So also from my side, uh, Thank you, thank, you, thank you to all of you for showing up here today. It's really great to see so many familiar profile pictures or names in the chat. So uh, really appreciate it that you took the time. So we already had a couple of comments in the chat. So we will make sure that we save them and that uh, Denise is going to read them. So we want to just focus on the questions here. Uh, we got the first one from David Lysabitz. Uh, regarding formation flying, have you looked at the propellant requirements for rotation and target sluice over the course of the mission? What is the propulsion system? Uh, personally, yeah, I haven't looked into that. Uh, this is something we will have to work on and, 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 and contact the, um, the Prisma team and the ESA team working on Proba 3. Um, I know the, the, the Prisma team uh, told us that it's uh, probably won't be too complicated to extend what they have been doing with two telescopes to, to more telescopes and to look into uh, fuel consumption for, for this kind of, of, of mission. But we haven't uh, gone to the, the detail of uh, how to, to, to design this, this, this concept. Great, thanks. Um... Next one, which detectors do you have in mind and which noise figures at 40k? So right now the idea is would be to have the same kind of uh, the best 10 micron detector that there is, which would be uh, the, the Aquarius detector that is in, in, in the James Webb. Uh, so the MIRI instrument, uh, I think that's still the state of the art. Um, that's the idea. The, the, the goal would be to have a, a, the same kind of, of detector, but with a slightly better uh, noise without noise. Um, I think we can still live with this uh, detector uh, if there is no other one, but I think this, this will limit uh, the number of stars and the spectral resolution that we can, uh, we can achieve. Um, but I, I know there are other uh, options on the table uh, that, uh, that can also be pushed to improve the, the quality of this 10 micron detector. Okay, next one is kind of following up to the, uh, the question before. Rotation seems an expensive way to modulate the exponent phase. Can other schemes work? Slow radiate expansion, contraction? Yeah, there are other possibilities for the modulation. Um, you can do this, this, this phase modulation uh, also. Um, there has been a lot of studies about that uh, during the Darwin and TPF, TPFI studies. Uh, but the best way was to, to really uh, uh, do the rotation because when you do phase modulation, you lose some of the planet flux uh, more than you do when, when you rotate. Um, but I, I would like to mention as well that if we know the planets in advance, uh, then we don't need to rotate. Rotate can be useful, but it's not mandatory. If we know where the planets are, uh, we can just configure the array uh, in the best way possible for the position, for the current position of the planet and then stare at the system without without moving then there's a question about um so hebex has chosen to use the star shade rather than nulling interferometry to achieve imaging at optical wavelengths what is the rationale for choosing interferometry in the infrared over a similar star shade concept uh, it's all about the size of the of the telescope um, so you need uh in order to resolve the habitable zone around a significant amount of stars. You need a really big aperture. And so the star shape doesn't help with that. Um, you still need, even with the star shape, you will need a really huge um, prim primary mirror for your uh, telescope. So, uh... 
still people talking about the propellant issue with rotation. What is the max rotation rate you expect? Um, I think it will depend on the length of the of of the I mean the size of the array, but it's something like for the Darwin TPFI studies, it was something like fifty thousand seconds or so fourteen hours. This is why I I, I mentioned that that uh, that's uh, the time scale for the stability of the instrument. It's the the default um, value, but th this has to be optimized uh, depending on the on the size of the, of the baselines, which depends on on which star we we are looking at looking at looking at. Okay, and I think the next question might even be a good one to segue slowly into the uh, general discussion. So maybe we, with that question, we open it up to everyone. In case LUVA and HABEX don't get funded or drag on for a long time, can we do a visible life interferometer? Uh, there were some studies about that. There was the visible NULLR study in the US. Um, and it's it's a really interesting idea. I think that's that's possible. Uh, nulling at at uh, in the visible, it's more difficult. Huh? The shorter the wavelength, the more difficult it is to achieve really high contrast. But that's uh, definitely something that that's possible. Yeah. Okay. I think with that, I just send it over to Tim, who will uh, lead the general discussion. Thanks again to everyone, and see you hopefully in real life sooner than later again. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Denny and uh, Sasha as well. Um, all right, so um, let's come, I think before we uh, keep going with the general discussion, let us maybe um, shortly come back to the three questions that were still there for the first talk. Um, so I think the first one was from Alain Leger for Sasha. What is the concentration of methane N2O CO you assumed for the simulations. For example, methane equals 1% would be easy to detect. Yeah, what, what we assume is, is present Earth uh, concentrations. Uh, and I think we went to, to, to the NASA database uh, where we have these, these profiles for the atmospheric compositions of all solar system planets. And we took this um, as, as input for, for our Earth twin uh, atmosphere. Um, by going through the literature, we found that uh, not everybody uh, necessarily uses the same number. So we're going to look a little bit into this, but as a baseline, this is this is what we're going to use. All right. Um, thank you. Sorry, I tried to scan these questions. Okay, we are missing still the question from Julien Girard. Um, Chris Stark et al. Pu just published a study on the prospects for directly imaging transiting exoplanets, mainly with the Louvois-A concept. Do you plan on investigating something similar for a live concept? Also for Sasha, the question. Um, I think it's, it's sort of interesting, but not, not absolutely necessary. And the, the reason is the following. Why, I mean, you get additional information um, from the transit, in particular the radius. And I think for direct imaging, this is very important because you have the the size albedo degeneracy. So if you get an additional constraint on any of these parameters, you can constrain the atmosphere much, much, much better. Um, I, um, I hope you, 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 you saw that with the direct detection and thermal emission, you have a already very relatively good constraint uh, on, on the radius. And if you get a high signal to noise spectrum, this could be really, really um, um, good enough, I, say, I would say for a robust atmospheric characterization. So you don't need that, that extra bit um, so it's not the, the main focus, um, and uh, as I said, in terms of in terms of sensitivity, um, it's really even with a concept like life, you cannot go beyond um, reasonably well beyond let's say 20 parsecs or so, and normally you would you don't need that. So depending on where the next transiting planet is, we would have to look into how costly it would be. And at the moment, I don't think it's 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 justified uh, unless there's something very exciting popping up. All right, thank you. Um, the next last question, which belonged to the uh, first talk, was from Haiyang Wang. Um, there seems to be overlap between theme two, habitable planets, and theme three, and biosignatures. What are the specific focuses of each theme? Yeah, th this, is, this is a very good point. Um, I, I tried to, to motivate this a little bit at the beginning. The, re the reason is uh, that, uh, for, at least from our current discussions, 
the, the jumping from the diversity of exoplanets to biosignatures. This is a long way. And I think because biosignatures is such a complex question and such a complex field in itself, um, to really understand this, there are a lot of additional work is needed to be sure that if you find something um, that is interesting and, and promising, that you can really have good quantitative arguments for such a strong claim. Uh, so for me, or for us that in the discussions, we always had this middle ground that maybe uh, we cannot necessarily expect to find all these biosignatures. So we should also be able to have a good, a good number on uh, potentially uh, interesting plants in terms of the, po the possibility of these plants having a liquid water on, on the surface. Uh, and then I, I provided some arguments for why maybe 30 to 50 uh, plants is, is a good number. But this is part of an ongoing discussion. So all of this, and I think, and I hope that this was also a little bit transported to all of you, both on the science side and on the technology side, this is really ongoing work. Uh, we are really interested in reaching out and getting additional opinions and, and feedback on all of these, and all of these things. Uh, we wanted to share with you our current ideas and thoughts. Uh, but this is not meant to be the, the ultimate word or the final word on, on any of this. Okay, thank you. Before I keep continue reading these questions, um, you're also encouraged now again to use this raise hand feature. So in case you do this, I will, we will screen the participant list and then unmute you so you can ask your question or comment, uh, say your comment, the comment yourself. So I think that we had a, um, a comment from Stefan about that the inner working angle would be too large at n-band for feasible size star shade. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, do, you, do you want to comment on that, Denny, or uh, should we just leave it there? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you understand uh, why it would be too large. Uh, yeah, maybe the, yeah, the star shade will have to be too big for... Uh, but I, I'm not sure to get the, the point. Okay, perhaps Stefan can rephrase it as a question further down and we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, question from Brian Hicks. Is the chief deputy distribution expected to be fixed? I believe this is for Denis. The chief deputy has to be fixed. So the chief deputy, you mean the, the beam combiner spacecraft or? Um, okay. Uh, uh, it has to be fixed, yeah, but it, it has to, to rotate as well uh, since the, 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 the spacecraft around it will, will rotate. So the, the, the main combiner, the beam combiner spacecraft will have to, um, to follow uh, the, the rotation of the other uh, collecting mirrors. But yeah, it's, it's, a fixed, uh, it, it's fixed relative to the other uh, mirrors. Okay, and um, we have a comment by Bertrand Menesson that another issue with star, star shades in the mid-infrared is thermal emission from the star, star, star shade side facing the telescope. Okay, that's a comment. Um, Jose Caballero from Madrid asks um, about the approximate budget. Uh, less than JWT, JWST, question mark. This is a question for everyone, I guess. <laughs> Anyone wants to comment on that? I think that, that uh, we are, we are really at, at, at the beginning of, of this exercise. And this is of course a question that we already discussed also at the ESA workshop uh, last year when we presented this, the, the, the science of, of, of such a mission. And this will come back all the time. I think it's, it's um, sort of uh, clear that uh, this, if you think about the ESA schemes, that this will exceed the, the budget of an M-class mission. I think this is pretty clear. And then the big question is, uh, if you were to follow this in the ESA, uh, follow this up in the ESA framework, uh, how big can the, the, the mirrors be in order that it still fits in an L-class mission? An L-class mission is two yearly budgets of ESA, which is roughly 1 billion um, euros. So there it is. In principle, you can now uh, run all these simulations for different sizes of, of primary mirrors and so on, and can uh, give you the number of planets. And then you can see how much you get, uh, depending on how much you think for, um, for, for mirrors of a certain size will, will cost plus, plus the beam combiner. Um, so we don't, we don't have a number already available, but it's certainly an excess of an M-class mission. It's probably uh, of, a t of an L-class type. And I would certainly hope that, that you can get it done for much cheaper than James Webb. And we already, I mean, we were, we were, we were playing around a little bit with, with uh, toying around with ideas, 
if you have to build four times the same telescope, right? The first one, this is the most expensive one. And the second one you get for half the price and the third one you get for a third of the price. It's not working like this, obviously, but uh, it's not like you have to develop five independent, uh, independent spacecraft. This is certainly not the case and this has to be kept in mind. And uh, again, in, in, in uh, early discussions, we also uh, had the idea that we could then sort of distribute, uh, distribute the manufacturing, right? This has disadvantages as we, some of us know from Alma, but in principle, uh, you can imagine a scheme where different partners come together and uh, each one contributes, uh, for instance, one of the collector telescopes. This is not, again, completely out of, out of the box and, and we're trying to understand what is really required. We would like to move forward with the science and understand what is needed at the next step. And then over time, uh, generate more support and also get more financial support to follow this up. And whether this will then be within the ESA framework or not, this will, will, will be, we will see. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from David Lazerwitz. Um, oh, sorry for the name pronunciation. Do you envisage getting to life in one great leap? Do you imagine an intermediate class mission or maybe a structurally connected interferometer, not just a tech demo, um, that is needed to drive the technology and reduce the risk incrementally? Yeah, both to Denis and Sasha, I don't know. Also, everyone else is encouraged again to speak up now, who is also connected to the live mission. Well, everyone else who has worked on that and attended the workshop. So please raise your hand in case you want to say something to a comment. Yeah, so th there are uh, different teams working on uh, demonstrating technologies uh, required for life on small platform. So there is uh, Paris working on the first S mission, uh, which will be a CubeSat doing interferometry in space. Um, there is also Mike Island in, in, in Australia working on, on, on CubeSat mission for formation flying. At the CSL, we are also working uh, on, on, a, on a concept to do um, a, a small uh, mission dedicated to Alpha, the Alpha Centauri system uh, to, to, to build uh, confidence in technology blocks which are required for life. Um, so that, that's that's those different activities uh, that, that are going in parallel to, uh, to the life activities. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Jean-Philippe Berger. Um, are you considering double blind testing involving independent teams that could confirm your det detectability statistics and spec spectra extraction? I believe that's for Dini. Uh, you wanted to say something, Sasha, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I muted because it was about uh, yield, yield estimates and, and spectral extraction. Um, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yes. At the, at the moment, we are sort of, um, uh, well, not resource limited, but we have one team now working on, on creating the this, this spectra and computing, computing the yield with one, with one uh, life sim tool that we, that we have developed or are developing here. If there's other groups who are interested in just getting the simulated uh, uh, simulated data and trying to extract uh, the, the, the information of the planets, that would be a very, very good idea. Um, and we would be very happy to cooperate and share data as much as we can. That's not a problem at all. At the moment, we don't, we don't do this yet, but it's certainly, I think, a very, very good point uh, moving forward to make sure that um, this is, we, are not, we are not biased in, in, in any way. Okay, um, so the next comment, oh no, it's a question from Bill Danchi, is the situation for life is somewhat similar to LISA. Can we get some coast insights from LISA Fox? Yeah. <laughs> um. I think it's at, at this point in time, it's sort of too, too early. We, well, let's, let's put it this way. I have no, no insight into the current status uh, of, the, of the ESA process. Um, we have been in touch with them once after, uh, after we, um, we submitted the white paper and gave our presentation. There was one quick exchange. Uh, they had some follow-up questions and ever since we didn't really iterate on any of this in, anymore. So I don't know where we stand. It's my understanding that the senior committee will make some recommendations to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the senior panel uh, uh, that is then reporting to the, 
uh, to the director of, of science uh, towards the end uh, end of the summer, and, and then we will uh, and then we will see. In talking to some uh, senior colleagues here here in Europe, there are sort of split feelings about this idea of of, of, of teaming up, and, and the reason is that um, this is um, you want to have partners that are sort of. Uh, really committed and reliable, and some th some people say that depending on in which direction you, you look, it's not clear whether you have the reliable partner you're looking for. And apparently, there were some you know some hurt feelings from personal experience. That was at least how I interpreted it. So, in my dream world, and I tried to indicate this a little bit in in, in my presentation, I think it would be fantastic if, of course, we could, um, as an international community, support the next flagship that NASA is going to build in whatever way we can. But I think it's also important that other uh, parts uh, on the world lead other things and uh, that we then invite um, and other, other teams uh, to join these efforts. So if, if you were to dream for a minute, um, maybe in 30 years, both things could happen. Then we have one reflected light mission uh, that is American-led and one thermal emission uh, mission that is, that is, that is European-led. But this is too early to say, as I said, it's really now uh, too easy to see whether there's any chance or to comment on whether they see any chance of this becoming reality within the within the ESA Y 2050 process or not, and until then, it's sort of just guesswork. Okay, um, I, I think I'll just read out some comments so that everyone is aware of them. So we have a quest, uh, comment. No, this this is, a, this is the comment from Stefan on star shades. Habex has a 52 meter dot. Uh, diameter shade with an inner working angle of 60 micro arc seconds at one micron. At 10 micron, would, you would need a 520 um, star, meter star shade to get the same inner working angle or accept a 600, mi sorry, this is quite complicated to read, or accept a 600 micro arc seconds inner working angle for the 52 meter star shade. All right. So I would say it's not feasible or not useful. Okay. Um, so, the David uh, Laserwitz regarding his earlier comment about an intermediate mission, so that he's thinking about an M class mission as the intermediate step, um, such that uh, he thinks that life is more of a JWST coast class, which we may all agree to. Um, what is the most, uh, next question by Pin Chen, what is the most challenging or longest development timeline technology needed? for the live mission. Um, I think the, the work that is being uh, starting now at ETH with the, the NICE test bench is something that is um, really critical to show that we can do this, this measurement at cryo temperature. And this is um, a process that will take uh, years. Uh, and it's also a process that will need improvement in key component of milling and in, in, interferometric instrument like um, fibers and, and beam combiner uh, optics. Um, so I, I would say the main uh, technology to improve right now would be this um, demonstration of milling interferometry at cryo temperature. Um, uh, and then the second next would be the formation flying invol involving more than, than two uh, telescope. So this is the work that is uh, being started uh, by Mike, uh, and this will take uh, years to um, to demonstrate. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so there are some comments, and the next question I think is by Ramses Ramirez. Um, will life be observing planets around A stars? Um, in, in principle, it can. There's a few A stars in the, in the volume that we're currently considering. Uh, we have not put the main focus on, on them so far because there are not, not so many. And for us, at least for the time being, um, it was more to understand uh, what, what sort of planets we can find around solar type stars and M stars and how is the detection split between these two, two types of, of star, uh, stellar classes. Um, so A stars were not yet in the focus, but as I said, in principle, they could be included if there's a good scientific reasons to include them. The next question is by Mike Ireland. Um, is there a reason that the live team background... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, maybe this is not a question actually. <laughs> 
um, has the complex for, well, I don't know, um, ask the design team. Um, yeah, maybe we can skip over that question for a second. A rotating strip can be interesting, but how would you get the nulling contrast? Um, I believe that's for Dini. Uh, yeah, I think you can do that with a chronograph if you have a, a strip rotating, which is long enough, and you have a chronograph. That could, could also be a solution. Um, but can we, can we get this strip to be uh, 100 meters long or not? I, I don't think that's, that's feasible. Um, I think that, yeah. There, there was some proposal to do that in, in the past, um, but I have not seen anything uh, convincing uh, about that. Let me, let me maybe just add that um, because we were talking about different potential architectures and different potential ways of modulating the signal, um, with the simulator we sort of following the current baseline that, that we have in mind and understand what the, what the yield and the, the, the capabilities of, of this will be. And then we will start changing the, the size of the primary mirrors to investigate you know, what sort of, how, how much science would be lost. But then one of the steps thereafter is certainly to also investigate alternative uh, architectures and to compare uh, again uh, the, the yields and also the characterization potential. And then you could also imagine different, uh, different modulation schemes and not only different numbers of telescopes. So this is sort of always uh, further down the road to really make sure that we're not missing out on, on, on anything important. And we really have a good quantitative understanding uh, what, the, uh, what the impact on the science of, of different architectures and different uh, motivation schemes would be. And let me also say that with the simulator, we can sort of already now sort of track uh, sort of the rotation speed that would be required to, to, to observe certain, uh, certain types of plants around certain types of stars. So, Again, with the baseline mission, uh, we could uh, look at what we, what we would assume in terms of, of rotation speed and, and so on and so on to get a first idea uh, what, we are, what we are talking about and then confront this with um, uh, some of the estimates from, uh, from, from the technology side and also what sort of technology is in principle available. So this is something on the to-do list, but further down the road. We cannot, unfortunately, not do everything at the same time. Okay, we, we are getting less questions and more comments in the chat. So I um, encourage everyone again, actually, if you want to hear everyone or want to comment, please raise your hand so then you can, or you can unmute yourself. That may, will make it easier for um, the general discussion. So let's see, is there still a question left at the moment? In any case, um, while well, you can think of potential questions, further questions, um, I want to shortly highlight again at the very end of the meeting, want to highlight again the, the two meetings, uh, the upcoming meeting in Liège in the end of November. Uh, Dini talked about this already. Um, which will be uh, November 30, and um, followed by the sci-fi workshop number one. So you can see, uh, you can of course always uh, see further information on the website, livespacemission.com. And the registration for the Liège workshops already open, which is which you can find here under this, under this URL. This will be of course um, announced again to the live mailing list. Um, I think if no one else, has oh, Ryan, any... Ryan McDonald raised his hand. Should oh, thank you so much. Yeah, then br 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 can you, Ryan, can, uh, you, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, I had a question on the retrieval aspects. So one thing that the aerial mission did recently that I was involved in was a, a retrieval challenge where simulated observations were generated and we had about five different teams retrieve on them with some data sets being blind, some being unblind. 
and that helped us to calibrate all of our models and make sure everyone's on the same page. So I was wondering whether a similar thing could be helpful for the life concept, because there aren't actually that many retrieval tools which have been developed for a direct thermal emission. So that would not only be helpful for the mission, but also helpful for the entire community to spur more development for such tools. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so my question is any thoughts on a retrieval challenge? I think this is indeed a very, very good idea. And it, we, ha we had this on our minds, minds as well. Uh, we started off with this retrieval with a specific goal in trying to understand some of the technical requirements. How much, for instance, do you lose if you don't go to 20 microns, but only to 17, for instance? How much do you gain if you go from six to three microns? Because depending on what wavelength range you're considering, you, you put additional technical constraints on the instrument. If you go to longer wavelengths, cooling becomes a problem or the thermal uh, part becomes a problem. If you go to shorter wavelengths, the accuracy on the nulling itself becomes more challenging. So this was the primary goal for the current activities to run this grid uh, of, of, of models and understand the impact on changing this instrumental, uh, of changing these instrumental parameters on the retrieved uh, signal. Once we have that in principle, we could then sure open up and really ask the question not only for Earth twins, but for all different kinds of plants you may you, you can imagine. Uh, how much do we learn or lose depending on uh, just from, from the different retrieval approaches? Uh, this is certainly something that we, we could done and I think we would be very happy to engage with, with a wider community exactly on, 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 on one of these topics. And as you said, there has been so much work put into retrievals focusing on transiting in secondary eclipse um, uh, measurements and not so much has yet been done on, on thermal emission. So there's certainly lots to be learned and to be, to be done in this regard and we will certainly keep this in mind. I think that's a very good idea. Yes, so um, also there was a question earlier about the slides. In addition to the recordings of the talks uh, being uploaded to the website at some point in the next few days and we will also post the slides so in case you want to revisit the slides at some point um, they are the, they will be on the website okay and um, last comment well um, I believe you can all see the chat so I will not keep reading those out loud um, we will also some specific comments from the chat and perhaps we will, uh, we will be able to create a frequently asked questions sections or so on the, on the website. So some of these questions, thank you very much, um, are very useful for that. And in other news also, it would be great if you of course uh, send us comments um, via the website uh, and, and the live mailing list. And also there's a Slack. So, um, that was, which makes it much easier, of course, to uh, work in working groups. So uh, after the, as, as Sasha announced in the beginning, after this, after this, um, after the any, any end of the meeting, we will send you a mail in the next few days and ask you for your permission to be added to the mailing list. And if you say yes to this, we will add you both to the mailing list and we send you an inv invite to the Slack. And um, yeah, I think I don't see any further hand raises at the moment. And there's a comment about the data challenge, but also no further question. And I think uh, let's call it a day um, with this. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, it was really great. Um, thank you to both presenters uh, for, for presenting these, um, these uh, the live. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. And we hope that you will be able, uh, that you became interested if you haven't come into contact with the live project so far, that you are now interested in it and will be able uh, or interested in joining the efforts. Um, please think about joining the mailing list and register for the upcoming live, uh, live workshops. Thank you very much and um, have a good day and stay safe in the pandemic. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye.